The Battle of Sitka was the last major armed conflict between Russians and Alaska natives, and was initiated in response to the destruction of a Russian trading post two years before. The primary combatant groups were the Kicks.RD clan of Sheet Kar XAATI of the Tlingite Nation and agents of the Shelikov Belikov Company. Later Russian American Company assisted by the Imperial Russian Navy. Though the Russians' initial assault was repelled, their naval escorts bombarded the Tlingite fort Shiskinor mercilessly, driving the natives into the surrounding forest after only a few days. The Russian victory was decisive, and resulted in the Sheet Karwan being permanently displaced from their ancestral lands. They fled north and re-established an old settlement on the neighboring Chichagov Island to enforce a trade embargo against the Russians. Animosity between the two cultures, though greatly diminished, continued in the form of sporadic attacks by the natives against the Russian settlement as late as 1858. The battlefield location has been preserved at Sitka National Historical Park. In September 2004, in recognition of the battle's bicentennial, a direct descendant of Russian battle leader Baranov joined with descendants of the Kicks.RD warriors for a traditional Tlingite cry ceremony to formally grieve for their lost ancestors, previous colonization and resistance. Members of the Kicks.RD of the indigenous Tlingite people had occupied portions of the Alaska Panhandle, including Sheet Car XAATI, for some 11,000 years. Alexander Baranov first visited the island aboard the Ekaterina in 1795 while searching for new sea otter hunting grounds. Baranov paid the Tlingite a sum for the rights to the land in order to prevent interlopers from conducting trade on the island. On 7 July 1799, Baranov, with 100 fellow Russians, sailed into Sitka Sound aboard the galley Olga, the Brigga Katerina, the packet boat Oral, and a fleet of some 550 Baidakas, carrying 700 Aleutians and 300 other natives. Wishing to avoid a confrontation with the Kicks.RD, the group passed by the strategic hilltop encampment where the Tlingite had established Norta Line and made landfall at their second-choice building site. Some seven miles north of the colony, the location of the Russian settlement at Katliansky Bay, Redoubt St. Michael, is known today as Stariga Van Bay or Old Harbor, the outpost consisted of a large warehouse, blacksmith shop, cattle sheds, barracks, stockade, block house, a bath house, quarters for the hunters, and a residence for Baranov. Though the Kolashi initially welcomed the newcomers, their animosity toward the Russians grew in relatively short order. The Kicks.RD objected to the Russian traders' custom of taking native women as their wives and were constantly taunted by other Tlingite clans who looked upon the Sikas as the outsiders Kalga, or slaves. The Kicks.RD came to realize that the Russians' continued presence demanded their allegiance to the Tsar, and that they therefore were expected to provide free labor to the company. Competition between the two groups for the island's resources would escalate as well. 1802 battle Despite a number of unsuccessful Tlingite attacks against the post during the winter of 1799, business soon prospered. Urgent matters required that Baranov return to Kodiak in 1800. Twenty-five Russians and fifty-five Alush, under the direction of Vasily I.G. Medvedinov, were left to staff the post. In spring 1802, the population of Redoubt St. Michael had grown to include 29 Russians, three British deserters, 200 Alush, and a few Kodiak women. It was rumored that the British staged a meeting with the northern Tlingite clans in Angoon in 1801, wherein they offered muskets and gunpowder to the Tlingite in exchange for exclusive fur trading rights. In June 1802, a group of Tlingite warriors attacked the Russian fort at midday. Led by Scout Lalton Kotlian, the raiding party massacred many, looted the Seotta pelts, and burned the settlement, including a ship under construction. A few Russians and Aleush who had been away from the post hunting, or who had fled into the forest, 
subsequently reached safety and relayed news of the attack. British Captain Barber, Unicorn, seized the ringleaders, a rescued three Russians, 20 other native allies, and many of the pelts. The Unicorn then set sail for Kodiak, where it delivered the survivors and the news of the attack to Baranov on June 24. Barber extracted a ransom of 10,000 rubles for the return of the colonists, a mere 20% of his initial demand. Russian reprisal. Following the Kicks.RD victory, Tillingite shame and Strunuk confident that the Russians would soon return, and in force, urged the clan to construct a new fortification that was capable of withstanding cannon fire, and provided an ample water supply. Despite strong opposition, the shamans were prevailed, and the Kicks.Hardy made preparations for war. The Sitkas sent messages to their allies requesting assistance, but none was forthcoming. They would face the Russian fleet on their own. The Tillingite chose to construct the roughly 240 feet by 165 feet Shisajin or at the high water line near the mouth of the Indian River to take advantage of the long gravel beach flats that extend far out into the bay. It was hoped that the shallows would prevent the Russian ships from attacking the installation at close range. Some 1,000 native spruce logs were used in the construction of 14 buildings and the thick palisade wall that surrounded them. The Kicks.RD battle plan was a simple one. They would gauge the Russians' strength and intentions at Norta Line, then strategically retreat to the perceived safety of the new fort. Baranov returned to Sitka Sound in late September 1804 aboard the sloop of war Neva under the command of Lieutenant Commander Yuri Fyodorovich Lysiansky. Neva was accompanied by the Ermac and two other smaller, armed sailing ships, manned by 150 Pramish Leniks, along with 400 to 500 Aleutian 250 Baydarkas. In this engagement, fortune favored the Russians from the outset. On September 29, the Russians went ashore at the Winter Village. Lysiansky dubbed the site Novo Archangelskaya Mikhailovskaya, a reference to the largest city in the region where Governor Baranov was born. Baranov immediately sent forth envoys to the Tillingite settlement with offers of negotiation for the Norta Line site, all of which were rebuffed. The Tillingite merely hoped to stall the Russians long enough to allow the natives to abandon their winter village and occupy the sapling fort without the enemy fleet taking notice. However, when the Kicks.RD sent a small, armed party to retrieve their gunpowder reserves from an island in nearby Shasayan, the group was spotted and engaged in brief a firefight with the Russians. An errant round struck the canoe in which the Tillingite were transporting the gunpowder, igniting the cargo and causing it to explode. When the smoke cleared, it was evident that none of the expedition, comprising upper caste young men from each house and a highly respected elder, survived the encounter. Baranov's emissaries notified the Tillingite that the Russian ships would soon begin firing on the new fort. Day one on or about October 1st, Neva was towed by the Aleush from Crest of Sound into the shoals near the mouth of the Indian River. A Russian landing party, led by Baranov and accompanied by about 150 men, assaulted the Tlingite compound, only to be met by continuous volleys of gunfire. The Aleush panicked and broke ranks, retreating to the shore where their Baydarkas waited. The Kicks.RD warriors, led by their new war chief Alan, wearing a raven mask and armed with a blacksmith's hammer, surged out of Shiskinor and engaged the attacking force in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A second wave of Tillingite emerged from the adjacent woods in a pincer maneuver. Baranov was seriously injured and the Russians fell back to the water's edge just as Neva opened fire to cover the retreat. Twelve of the attackers were killed and many others injured during the melee, and the Russians were forced to abandon several small artillery pieces on the beach. Lysiansky reports only two were killed, but 14 wounded, and they were able to save their guns. That night, the Tlingite rejoiced at having repulsed the Russian onslaught. 
day two in as much as Baranov's battlefield wounds prevented him from continuing the battle, Lieutenant Commander Lysiansky assumed command, ordering his ships to begin shore bombardment of the Tlingite position. The initial barrage consisted mainly of ranging shots, as the vessels attempted to determine the optimum firing range. Unable to breach the fort's walls, the Russians ceased fire in the early afternoon and sent a messenger ashore under a flag of truce. According to Lezhensky, it was constructed of wood, so thick and strong, that the shot from my guns could not penetrate it at the short distance of a cable's length. Much to the kicks.rd's amusement, the message demanded their surrender, which they rejected out of hand. The Tlingite replied with their own demand that the Russians surrender, which was also rejected. The Russian cannon fire resumed until nightfall. After dark, the Kicks.rd met to consider their situation. They all believed that the Russians suffered too many losses the day before to mount another ground attack. The Tlingites' goal had been to hold out long enough to allow the northern clans to arrive and reinforce their numbers. But the shortage of gunpowder limited their ability to remain under siege, a factor that made ultimate victory seem less likely. The Tlingite concluded that a change in tactics was in order. Rather than suffer the ignominy of defeat on the battlefield, they formulated a strategy wherein the clan would disappear into the surrounding forest and establish a new settlement on the northern part of the island. Day 3 Neva and her escorts resumed their day-long bombardment of the Tlingite fort at sunrise. The Kicks.Hardy responded with offers of a truce, hostage exchanges, promises of more talks, and even the possibility of surrender. Unbeknownst to the Russians, the clan's elderly and young children had already begun the trek to Gaajaan. At nightfall, the house chiefs met again to discuss their planned march across the island. Mothers with infant children were to depart in the morning. Day 4 The naval cannon fire began at daybreak, halting periodically to allow the Russians to extend offers of peace to the Kicks.rd, which were in turn rejected. That afternoon, the Tlingites' response was that they had tired of battle, and would accede to the Russian demands to evacuate Shisajin or the following day. Once the sun had set, the natives held their last gathering in the sapling fort. The elders offered praise for their clansmen who had defended the Kicks.rd homeland against a formidable enemy. The clan gathered together for a last song, one that ended with a loud drum roll and a wail of anguish. The Tlingite then departed undetected under the cover of darkness. Aftermath It wasn't until the evening of 6 October that the Kicks.rd put forth their tragic swan song. The Russians landed a large contingent of troops to secure the beachhead and to reconnoiter the area in and around Shisajinor. To their great surprise, none of the natives were to be found. On October 8, Captain Lysiansky visited the abandoned Tlingite fortification, in which he estimated 800 males live, and recorded, What anguish did I feel, when I saw, like a second massacre of innocents, numbers of young children lying together murdered, lest their cries, if they had been born away with their cruel parents, should have led to a discovery of the retreat. The fort was raised to preclude the possibility of its being used as a stronghold against the Russians and their allies ever again. Neva sailed out of Sitka Sound on November 10. Sitka Kicks.rd Survival March The first leg of the Tlingite sojourn entailed a hike west from Gajaren to Daxet. From there, the group's exact path across the mountains north to Charthaya Nor is a matter of some conjecture. However, a coastal route around the bays of northwest Baranov Island appears to be the most likely course as it would have allowed the travelers to circumvent the island's dense forests. Based on significant first-hand research into the event conducted by Herb and Frank Hope of the Sheikhawan, Sitka tribe of Alaska, canoes fashioned out of red cedar trunks facilitated the ocean crossing to Chichagoff Island. 
Several warriors remained in the vicinity of Norta line after the battle as a sort of rear guard, in order to both harass the Russian settlers and to prevent them from pursuing the Kickstarter during their flight north. Shortly thereafter, eight loose trappers were killed in Jamestown Bay and another was shot in the woods adjacent to New Archangel. From that point forward, Russian hunting parties went out in force, ever alert to the possibility of attack. The Kickstarter encouraged other Tlingite clans to avoid contact with the Russians by any means possible. Russian Alaska atop the Kekor at Norta Line, the Russians constructed a fortress of their own consisting of a high wooden palisade with three watchtowers for defense against Tlingite attacks. By the summer of 1805, a total of eight buildings had been erected inside the compound, including workshops, barracks, and the governor's residence. Aside from their annual expeditions to Herring Rock, near the mouth of the Indian River, the Kickstart by and large steered clear of the ever-expanding settlement until 1821, when the Russians invited the Tlingite to return to Sitka, which was designated as the new capital of Russian America in 1808. The Tlingite who chose to return were allowed to reside in a part of the village just below the heavily guarded stockade on Blockhouse Hill. Russian cannon were constantly trained on the natives as a reminder of their defeat at Shisaginor. The Kickstart Hardy supplied the Russians with food and otter pelts. While the colonists introduced the Tlingite to the various aspects of Russian culture in the Russian Orthodox Church, Occasional acts of Tlingite aggression continued until 1858, with one significant uprising occurring in 1855. In 1867 Russian America was sold to the U.S. After that, all the holdings of the Russian American Company's holdings were liquidated. Following the transfer, many elders of the local Tlingite tribe maintained that Castle Hill comprised the only land that Russia was entitled to sell. Native land claims were not addressed until the latter half of the 20th century, with the signing of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. The 1880 census reported a population of 43 Tlingite living in and around the Indian River, the Kickstarter's traditional summer fishing camp. Tributes U.S. President Benjamin Harrison set aside the Shisaji nor site for public use in 1890. Sitka National Historical Park was established on the battle site on October 18, 1972, to commemorate the Tlingite and Russian experiences in Alaska. Today, the Kalyan Pole stands guard over the Shisaji nor site to honor the Tlingite casualties. Tarita, a memorial to the Russian sailors who died in the battle, is located across the Indian River at site of the Russians' landing. In September 2004, in observance of the battle's bicentennial, descendants of the combatants from both sides joined in a traditional Tlingite cry ceremony to formally mourn their lost ancestors. The next day, the Kickstarter hosted a formal reconciliation ceremony to put away the two centuries of grief. Historic designations National Register of Historic Places hash NPS 6600162 Baranoff Castle Hill Site National Register of Historic Places hash NPS 6600164 Battle of Sitka Site National Register of Historic Places hash NPS 6600166 Old Sitka Site